so far in the course we have discussed different aspects of transmission lines in this particular class in this particular lecture let us look at transmission lines from a practical perspective as we have discussed so far transmission line in its simplest form is a two conductor system which looks like this so one side for the source one side for the load and what not the question now is that as far as rf applications are concerned can we treat transmission lines literally as a pair of two conductors or a pair of two wires just the way it looks like in this diagram well in practice there are various forms in which a transmission line may be realized and you don't necessarily need to have full fledged expertise in rf applications to know the different forms of transmission lines in practice in many of your earlier circuits courses your basic circuits courses and in practice you may have come across two conductor systems which essentially carry signals from one point to another point so let us take a look at what those are the very first and very commonly used form of a transmission line in a two conductor form is what is called as a coaxial cable one of the most simple applications is the cable for the television which comes to our houses and that is one domestic application with which is essentially a coaxial cable that carries the tv signals from the antenna to the set top box or the tv and essentially just the as the name suggests it has two conductors placed in a way that their axes are the same so essentially the conductors are nothing but circular in shape so if i draw a cross sectional view this is what it would look like this is called as the outer conductor which looks kind of like a cylinder lengthwise and inside this cylinder there is one more conductor which is cylindrical and that is solid and that also looks like a thinner cylinder of smaller diameter so that is why the word coaxial comes because their axes are essentially uh, aligned together so this is called as the outer conductor and this one is the inner conductor so the first question that we can ask is what is the characteristic impedance of this coaxial cable so as you know from transmission line theory the characterize the characteristic impedance of any transmission line or in particular any lossless transmission line is under root of l by c where l and c are the per unit length inductance and capacitance respectively so the question is if we want to find out the z0 of a coaxial cable we have to find out the per unit length inductance and capacitance of this line so essentially that depends a lot on the dimensions of the conductors so let us say if the inner conductor has a diameter a and the outer conductor has a diameter b
something tells us that the length of the line does not govern the characteristic impedance and that is true also as per definition of characteristic impedance it is a function of frequency as well as the <coughs> per unit length quantities but for a lossless transmission line it is a function of the per unit length inductance and capacitance only now to calculate the inductance and capacitance it is not enough for us to know just the dimensions of the conductors only we also need to know what is the material that is separating the two conductors because as you remember as you remember the electromagnetic phenomena in particular capacitance between two conductors always depends on the material that is separating the two plates so therefore in the middle in this area in this space between the two conductors there always exists an insulator or a dielectric let us say the insulator has a permittivity relative permittivity epsilon r and it has a relative permeability nu r most dielectrics have nu r as 1 so long as they are not magnetic materials epsilon r can be anything so knowing this knowing this we can say that the net permeability mu that is nothing but mu not times mu r where mu not or mu zero is the permeability of free space likewise i can say the net permittivity epsilon likewise is epsilon zero times epsilon r where epsilon zero is the permittivity of free space so after knowing this one can derive what is l and what is c the per unit length so therefore this l is derived as the following manner it, it is found out to be mu by 2 pi the natural log of b over a where b and a are the diameters of the outer and inner conductors respectively likewise c is given as 2 pi times epsilon divided by natural log of b over a the proof is beyond the scope of this course however there are things that you can make out by looking at the final results so you can say that as b increases the inductance also increases but as b increases the capacitance reduces so there therefore you can effectively choose the dielectric material and you can also choose b and a as per the specifications given to you to realize the required value of z0 so let us say i want some particular value of z0 the most commonly used value of z0 is 50 ohms so let us say if i use if i want to make a coaxial cable which uh, sort of has a characteristic impedance of 50 ohms then i can design my per unit length inductance and capacitance values accordingly and therefore if i choose certain values i can choose mu i can choose b i can choose a i can choose epsilon so mu and epsilon are decided by the insulator that is separating the two conductors whereas b and a are the dimensions of the conductors themselves so this is one way through which you can very easily realize a coaxial cable another application where coaxial cable is used is in lab equipment where the connection from a circuit to a source or a circuit to a measuring instrument like an oscilloscope is in the form of a coaxial cable many of you may have noticed this in your basic circuit labs 
Now, while coaxial cable is pretty widely used, it has one drawback. That is that it is a very bulky structure. It is a little difficult. It is a little difficult for us to incorporate this bulky structure into planar structures or compact structures. That means if I have a very small circuit on a circuit board, I can use coaxial cables only until the circuit ends. But it is extremely difficult for me to integrate this coaxial cable into a planar compact circuit. So therefore, coaxial cables were very widely used. They still are very widely used. But as far as compact circuits are concerned, they are not very well used. And by the time the, you know, the World War II ended, people were already looking at different ways through which one can overcome the drawback of coaxial cables and essentially try to realize similar two conductor structures but in a more planar form. Circular or cylindrical is not really planar. So therefore, people or in particular, a person called Robert Barrett made a, made a small modification to the existing coaxial cable and came up with another kind of transmission line called as strip line. And how did, how did the modification in coaxial take place? Effectively, if this is coaxial, All he did was essentially take the outer conductor and essentially cut it along a halfway line of symmetry. Take the outer conductor, cut it. You now have two half cylinders and then take those two half cylinders, those half semicircular cylinders and then make them flat. So therefore, if you make them flat, the semicircle would become a straight line. And the lower semicircle would also become a straight line and eff effectively they would look like sheets. Then take the inner conductor and effectively hammer it in such a way that it becomes a thin metallic strip and this is what it looks like. So you again have three conductors but then in coaxial the outer conductor is normally a contiguous homogeneous conductor and usually that is connected to the ground. So therefore in strip line the top and bottom plates essentially are also ground. They are connected to ground. So So now, the question is, what is now between, inside the sandwich, between this conductor, this conductor, this conductor and this conductor? Well, you still have the di dielectric, which is some mu r and epsilon r. So, so, if you assume that the thickness of this metallic conductor essentially tends to zero, then this is called as an ideal strip line. And for most practical purposes, it is very, very thin, maybe of the order of a few tens of microns or even less. So again, the question is just like how we derived the Z0 for a coaxial cable. What is the Z0 for the strip line? Well, again the Z0 depends on mu r epsilon r and it also depends on the dimensions. Suppose the width of this conductor is W 
and the vertical height that is separating the metallic strip from either of the top or the bottom plates is B. I can even say that this is B, let us say. Then the characteristic impedance Z0, again the derivation of this Z0 is extremely complicated. So therefore it is not a part of this course, but it is useful if you have an idea of how the Z0 essentially changes with different parameters. So the Z0 is effectively derived as 30 pi divided by under root of epsilon r times h divided by we plus 0 0.441 b. Now what is h? h is this distance. So which is roughly about 2b. So this is the z0. But now what is we? we is called the effective width. And it is defined in this manner. we is equal to w by b minus. Now this minus, there can be two possible arguments depending on the case. Well, this is this is w, I should write it in small letters. It is minus 0 if w by b is more than 0 0.35 and it is 0 0.35 minus w by b whole square if w by b is less than 0.35. So you can use either of these two. Now it is absolutely not necessary for anybody to remember this formula because nowadays we have a lot of these mathematical tools which will give you the characteristic impedances if you know the dimensions and the material or it can also do the reverse. If you want a particular impedance at zero, the tool can synthesize the required dimensions for a given material mu r and epsilon r. So, some, but some things we can very quickly say by looking at this thing. If height is increased, if the height is increased, the z0 increases. But not so directly because even b increases. So the relationship is not exactly linear. But you have to see in what way the height is increased so that what effect it has on the change in the numerator and denominator. Whereas if I increase the width, if I increase the width, what is happening if I increase the width? In some sense I can say that we would also increase for most part. So if we increases then your z0 will decrease. So we can say that if w is increased then z0 will decrease and in some sense it sort of validates a very basic unrelated assumption that we have in circuit theory that if the width of a conductor is increased then its impedance reduces. But here z0 is not the impedance of the conductor but rather it is the characteristic impedance of the whole transmission line. But still it is a very easy way to remember that if you increase the width of the conductor, the z0 of the transmission line would reduce. Likewise, if epsilon r is increased, that means if the permittivity of the material is increased, then z0 would reduce. So this is, these are some of the properties of a strip line transmission line. So definitely this is a lot more planar, the strip line, 
when you compare it to a coaxial cable. But then again, it has certain drawbacks. This has certain drawbacks. The first drawbacks is that this is three layers. So therefore, if you want to integrate it onto a circuit board, you will need a circuit board having three layers. Generally, most circuit boards come in two layers, not more than that. So therefore, you will need a little bit of a more advanced fabrication technology, which would increase the cost. So this is a major disadvantage of this reply, but still it is used by many uh, low cost applications. For example, you can realize a three layer structure by sandwiching two two layer circuit boards. But that is not a very efficient structure because you can never make them as perfectly aligned with each other. There will always be some surface roughness and some air gaps will exist. Therefore, it will cause some losses. Now, from the electromagnetic perspective, if I look at the coaxial cable and uh, sort of assume that the current, let us say some AC current is flowing in this conductor, then the magnetic field would essentially look like this. And the electric field would look kind of like this, going from one conductor to another conductor. And the magnetic field would look like this as per the right hand thumb rule. Likewise in strip line, if the current is flowing in this direction, your magnetic field would also kind of look like this as per the shape, the cross sectional shape of the conductor. So if the current direction is this way, the magnetic field would be this way. And the electric field would exist between this conductor and either of these two. So therefore, it could exist on top as well as bottom. These are the electric field lines. It could also look like this. So this is the way the fields essentially exist in these transmission lines. Now. If we could have a planar transmission line as a modified version of this coaxial cable as a strip line to remove the requirement of this third layer, another form of planar transmission line was invented shortly after the strip line was invented. And that is called as the microstrip. Microstrip is a very easy to use piece of transmission line where you only have two conductors in two layers. And it is the most friendly form of a transmission line that can be integrated into a single layer circuit board. So therefore, if you have something like this, you have um, one plane which is sort of ground just like the strip line. If I take the strip line and make it half, thereby I remove the top plane, what I have simply is this. So let us say I can have define a surface where this is essentially sitting, this metallic strip. Let us say that this dielectric is epsilon r and above, above this conductor, above this dielectric, it is air. So this is what a microstrip looks like. Now, very interestingly, even if we have removed the top ground from the strip line, we cannot run away from the fact that even though we have reduced the number of conductors, 
we have one dielectric here and a different dielectric on top. That is something that is air and this dielectric which is not air. So therefore, at this boundary, you essentially have a boundary of two media. You may already be aware from your waves course, your electromagnetic waves course, that whenever there is a boundary of two media, let it be conducting, non-conducting, there is some different way in which the fields exist as compared to a homogeneous continuous medium. So therefore, unlike the coaxial and the strip line, where the dielectric itself was continuous and homogeneous, that we, it had only one uh, dielectric, the microstrip essentially has two dielectrics. So rather I should not write it as epsilon 0, I should say epsilon r is 1. In the microstrip you have two dielectrics. So therefore, so therefore, if I define that the width of this conductor is w and this height is h, there exists an effective dielectric constant, epsilon effective, which is a function of both epsilon r of the substrate as well as the, that of the air and that is equal to this. This is what the effective epsilon is. Once again, the proof is beyond the scope of this course and is immensely complex. So this is what we are going to just take a look at. And the Z0 or the characteristic impedance of this line, just like how we calculated or how we wrote in the case of the coaxial line as well as the strip line, the Z0 is given in this format as a function of the effective epsilon also. And Z0 again has two conditions depending on the dimensions. So the first is this is equal to 60 divided by under root of epsilon effective times ln of 8h by w plus w by 4h. This is if w by h is less than or equal to 1 and z0 is equal to a different formula that is 120 pi divided under root of epsilon effective times w by h plus 1.393 plus 0 0.667 times ln of w by h plus 1.444 and this is if w by h is more than 1. So these are very very big and complex formulae and just like strip line there are a number of calculators, good state of the art calculators, which encode this formulae. And for the given dimensions, given material properties, they can calculate the Z0 for you. Or if you have a fixed material and you want to design for a particular Z0, those tools can also calculate the required W and H for you. So, so far, we looked at three different kinds of transmission lines in practice, which effectively all have one thing in common and that is that they are all based on the two conductor system as we know in theory from transmission lines, but all of them have different properties. 
So, in case of the microstrip, the magnetic fields would exist something like this. If the current direction is this way, and the electric field would exist something of this kind. But if you notice, the fields are going through media boundaries. So because of those boundaries, there will be a small amount of loss. Especially in case of the electric and magnetic fields. So, therefore, even the microstrip looks very attractive, it is very, very low cost, it can be made very easily, and it is most ideally suited for quick and easy and low cost fabrication. There are indeed some drawbacks, but if you are very careful, you can work your way around the drawbacks also. Now, having discussed these different kinds of transmission lines in practice, let us also now start discussing about some applications of transmission lines. So let us suppose we have a lossless transmission line that has impedance z0 that is always real as you very well know by now. Now, now suppose I have a transmission line Loss, that is lossless and that has some impedance z0 and it has some particular length and the other side of the line is terminated with an impedance zl then let us say if the length of this line is some l over here the impedance will be z of l so what will that be so using the impedance transformation relation Z of L will be Z0 times ZL plus JZ0 and beta L divided by Z0 plus JZL and beta L. So so now let us keep things simple. So let's suppose let's suppose we choose a ZL such that it is zero. That means it's a short circuit. This is a short circuit. In such a case, if ZL is equal to zero, what will be Z of L? Simply put ZL as 0, what we will get is JZ0 and beta L. Right? So, let's call this beta L, since it is some angle parameter, let's call this beta L as some theta. And this theta is called as the electrical length. So, let's say that this is equal to JZ0 tan theta. So, L is the physical length, beta is the phase constant. So, theta is called as the electrical length and its unit is unit of an angle, either 
degrees or radians. Now, this is what Z of L will look like. Now, this is a purely imaginary quantity. But, I can immediately say that Z0 is real and it's positive. And, tan theta can be either a positive quantity or a negative quantity. So, therefore, when will tan theta be positive? So I can say tan theta will be positive when theta is above 0 but less than 90 degrees. So in that sense I can say that if I want my z of L to be positive, this will happen when, when theta is more than 0 and less than pi by 2. If it becomes exactly pi by 2, then it will become infinite, which we sort of don't want. So what this means is that if ZL is effectively has to be positive, the theta has to be in this range. So therefore, if theta is beta L, I can substitute that even beta L has to follow this. And what is beta L? We know beta is nothing but 2 pi by lambda. So 2 pi by lambda times L should also be between these two quantities. So simply if I cross multiply, I can say that my actual length must be between 0 and lambda by 4. For, for what? For ZL to be positive, but imaginary. So what was ZL? ZL is nothing but JZ0 tan beta L. jz0 tan beta l. Now, if this entire quantity is positive, I can say this is something like plus j of x. What does this indicate? This indicates a positive imaginary quantity which is nothing but inductive reactance. So, what this means is, if I take a lossless transmission line, terminate it with a short circuit, terminate it with a short circuit and keep the length of the line as less than lambda by 4, then the transmission line will behave like an inductor. So, therefore, this is what I mean. This is exactly the same as an inductor. So, what we are doing is we are effectively realizing something like J 2 pi FL, where L is the inductance. We are making a transmission line behave like a inductor. We are making a transmission line behave like an inductor. So you may question what is the big deal about this? We already have inductors very easily available. Then why do we need to realize inductors using transmission lines? Well, that is because as you increase the frequency, inductors become more and more non-ideal inductors become more and more non-ideal. Why? If you look at an inductor, effectively it looks like this. 
if you look at it closely. We expect that the inductor would essentially work with the principle of passing a current through it which creates a magnetic field. A time varying current will create a time varying magnetic field which will in turn induce some EMF into this coil and that is inductance. But what is happening is that there are so many of these coils which are placed in parallel to each other. There exists a very small series capacitance over here. There exists some parasitic capacitance between these coils. Now, what happens is the effect of the parasitics of the capacitance increases as the frequency increases. So, rather, what happens is as the frequency increases, the capacitance effectively becomes much much smaller and therefore the capacitive reactance increases. This is called as parasitic capacitance. So as and when the frequency is increased, then and then the inductor becomes more and more non-ideal. That is you are having an inductance as well as a capacitive impedance. So therefore, The inductors may not be able to give you the required amount of inductance or the inductive reactance at very high frequencies. Therefore, inductors are extremely difficult components to work with. They are extremely difficult to work with when at very high frequencies. Therefore, if you have a transmission line, there is no question of any coil. You can, you can definitely realize a much better inductor using the transmission line. Now, if we look at this discussion on realization of inductance using transmission line, we have the same lossless transmission line Z0 and whose length is below lambda by 4 and the impedance with which we terminate it, it that is ZL, now it is an open circuit. Earlier case, it was a short circuit. Now it has become an open circuit. So then, what will be Z of L? So Z of L will be what? So if ZL and ZL tend to infinity, so you can put the limit limiting case of the dead tends to infinity and what you will be left behind is this quantity z0 divided by j and beta l and if you notice very closely this is like 1 by jx or 1 by j 2 pi fc so if you have the same transmission line but you have an open load in place of a short load you can actually realize a capacitor This is also a very very useful application of transmission line that is realization of inductors and capacitors at very very high frequencies and they are extremely useful in RF applications. Now, now let us take this discussion up by one notch. Let us again have the transmission line. Which is lossless. And it is terminated with a short circuit. That is ZL equal to 0. So, now we know that if the length of the line is less than lambda by 4, it is like a inductor. But now, suppose I make the line length exactly equal to lambda by 4. What will happen? What will happen? 
Well, as per the impedance transformation theory, this short circuit will look like an open circuit. But is that it? Is that it? Or is there more to it than meets the eye? So suppose I call this as Z of L. We know that Z of L is derived in this form, this format Jz0 and beta L. Now let us do what? Let us plot Zn as a function of L. So obviously at the start it will look like a tan function. So at this point, this is the point where L becomes exactly equal to lambda by 4, where beta L becomes pi by 2 and thereafter the tan function would look like this. So effectively it is not just an open circuit, it looks as though the infinite is in, the, the impedance is infinite but it is a discontinuous point where L is lambda by 4 and at that same point it is a transition from a positive infinity to a negative infinity also. So therefore it is not just an open circuit, it indicates something deeper also. Up until this point, the ZL was positive, so therefore we can say it is inductive. But at this point ZL is negative, so therefore it is not inductive but it is capacitive. And exactly at lambda by 4 is the point at which the impedance is neither inductive nor capacitive or both inductive and capacitive. So therefore this point indicates resonance. Resonance where the impedance is infinite. So which kind of resonance gives us infinite impedance? It is the parallel resonance. So therefore if I have this kind of transmission line ended with a short circuit and a length of lambda by 4, it is very much like having an infinite impedance that results through a parallel L and C resonance. So if you want to realize resonance circuits also, you can do this. Likewise, you can arrive at the condition for series resonance also. So for series resonance, this length of the line has to be lambda by 2 or you can keep the length as lambda by 4 and make the load impedance infinite. So therefore, you can actually look at those points where the impedance essentially comes to 0. So let us say I have now in a different case where the length is lambda by 4 and the ZL tends to infinity. So therefore I can say that Z of L as we had proved it earlier that is Z0 divided by J tan beta L or that is like 1 by J Z0 cot beta L. So you will, if, if, if you now plot this function z of l as a function of l and look at those points where let us say you have a, you will have a crossover like this at lambda by 4. Here again it is capacitive, something of this kind it will be. And here it is inductive. So at this point we have a minima in the impedance that is resulting from a transition from the capacitive impedance to the inductive impedance and therefore this is an example of a series LC resonance. Both this one and that is corresponding to this point also. So in today's class we looked at some practical realizations of transmission lines that is the coaxial cable, the strip line and the microstrip lines 
and we saw a little bit about what they look like and what their impedance characteristics are and thereafter we looked at two applications of transmission lines. The first is to realize inductors and capacitors at very high frequencies and secondly to realize the resonance effects of series as well as parallel LC combinations. We shall continue in the next lecture. Thank you.